Okay. Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, and it's raining outside. It's really cold and wet, but we are warm in here. And next week is the Christmas coming, right? And remember, every year on the Christmas time, we go to see the Nutcracker. Remember, everyone? Uh -huh. Yeah. So this year we cannot go there, but uh, so I want to show you uh, to draw the Nutcracker today. And the Nutcracker is a symbol for Christmas. Every Christmas, if you go to the store, you can find the Nutcracker everywhere, right? People like to decorate that, put in the house. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Nutcracker, they have a story about that. Okay, and that story has been there for 200 years already. Okay, so it has a long history for this story. Okay, and the story is just about the little girl. She um, met the Nutcracker and they tried to fight with the Mouse King. Okay, and it happened at night when she didn't sleep. She go out and she see the the mouse king and his army, and the nutcracker show up and help her to fight with that mouse king. Okay, um, and the story all about the children, the magical because children they like to think something like magic, right? Something the adult people don't think about that, but uh, the children they know and they think and they believe about that. So, so that's all about the good thing about the Nutcracker. Okay, so and the Nutcracker and stuff on German. Okay, and they believe the Nutcracker is a symbol for good luck, uh, frightening away from some bad spirits. Right, so that's a good thing and. Uh, and they like to have the nutcracker in the house for the holiday to protecting the house, bring the good luck to the family. So that the meaning of the uh, nutcracker. Okay. And right now I will show you the nutcracker. They have a different way to decorate the nutcracker. It's just basically your imagination. You can do whatever you like. The the basic shape is just like this one right here. You see right there. That's the basic shape of the nutcracker. <laughs> and he's a soldier, so he looked really serious like this, right? <laughs> but the um, about the clothing, the hat, the shoe, they will decorate a different way to make it more festive, more Christmas. Okay, so this is the basic one, and I will show you a few more to see, so you can have uh, some idea. So later, when you draw your nutcracker, you can decorate the clothing, the shoe, the hat, the way you want. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is the basic one. You see that the Sonia, so that the way the Sonia long time ago they dress up like that, and they have a big tall hat. Right. Okay. So let's see the next one. Let's see. The tree. Why do they call it a nutcracker? They. I don't know. They just call that. Oh, no, they I just know. Call I know. Them. Because um, they actually usually the the head will lift up and you could put a okay. nut, and then you push down on the head and it cracks the nut open for you. Oh, that's good. That's, that's how he saw the nut. Uh -huh. you know no. Okay. No. Oh, well, Thank you, sure you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, but I, I didn't know. Was around when they made them. Oh, <laughs> really? Oh. Yeah, because they actually, originally they would use them to crack the nuts. Oh, oh so that's the reason they call the nutcracker. Yeah. Oh, the name say that, right? Oh, yeah. Nutcracker. Yeah. Right, Cindy? Yeah. You know yeah. that, right? I'm sure you know. Oh, you smart oh, lady. <laughs> okay, so this is a nutcracker. The, you see, it's a little bit different. Uh, uh, you know, the decoration inside of the um, shirt, the pen, the shoe, a little bit different, but the basic shape is still the same, okay? The, they just stand up like that, okay? Like okay, shoe. so, yes, okay, and we go to the next one, please. Thank you. Oh, so this, this one looks more Christmas, right? You oh. see with the um, oh. candy can, right? The gingerbread house. 
and look at he have some candy on his shoe and his uh, hat there. See, that's for Christmas time thing. Okay, and one more. Should we have one more thing? Oh, look at this one, really fancy. Oh, huh? oh. Gingerbread man, gingerbread house, uh, oh. candy can, and the candy oh. on the top of his hat. So, and um, that's how you will decorate your nutcracker. Whatever you want to do inside, it's up to you, okay? I just show you the basic shape of the nutcracker, okay? And Travis, I know you're very good about this, okay? So hopefully everybody can draw the nutcracker today and um, just let your imagination working as much as you can, okay? So right now I will, any, okay, Katie, what do you want to say? No? You like the nutcracker? You like the nutcracker? Yeah. Okay, so now I will show you how to draw the nutcracker, okay? All right, well. <coughs> Okay, let's see. Would you guys like to follow Twee and learn how to draw? No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll watch myself. Watch. I don't want to. You don't want to show your friend how to draw? Just like last week, you draw the gingerbread how very good, right? Oh, yeah. So I think. If you want, you can try, okay? Nothing yes. to lose, right? Yes, okay. Yeah. So, oh, yes. the nutcracker, oh, yes. you know, everybody will start with the head first, okay? So, everybody have your paper and your pencil? I guess. Okay, you did. Okay, so, uh, let's see. We will start from here. We just draw it first. Okay. So we just start with it quite just like a square thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and he wears his hat, right? So we just have a... Okay, just like you wear, you draw a square thing, okay? And now... One more line up here. Okay. okay, so now we draw it half. We have a top. Okay. And uh, before they have a long hair, the man before they have a little bit long hair, okay? Mm -hmm. So, we will go to his shoulder right here. So, let's see. One line right here. Okay, so we draw his hair. He have a long hair like this. Okay, um, you can draw the eye right now, right? The eye you just have a like this. This is a circle. Okay, uh, hit nose, the nose is just have a... Uh, okay, that's the nose. And the Sonia before, they usually have a hit like that. So, let's see. One side. Okay, one more line. 
Let's get a mustache. Uh huh. Like this. <coughs> so basically, hit five like that, right? Just simple thing. Okay, now you can go just hit like right here. Mm -hmm. And now we draw his body. Okay, the body first. So you can just straight line like that. Got the top of his tongue shelf right there. And now we have a Okay. Okay, so now we go to the leg. So just straight line. Straight line. Okay, so one. Okay, and his shoe. So they they wear the boot, right? So let me put this one on this side first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have the room for his foot right here, right? Okay, so just one side, this one, then okay. The board is high, so it's about this side, okay. Okay, so now, um, Jack, we finish with this one first. They have a sun blind. You know, on his clothes inside here, you can decorate whatever you want. I just give you some simple things, okay? Yeah. So you can have a sun line right here, and you can color the different color. One more line in the middle. Yeah. Okay. So what are you missing? Um, <coughs> what is the nutcracker missing, you guys? Oh my gosh. What are you missing? A mustache. He did? Sure. Right here. What yeah. are you missing? His hand. His hand. Very good. Hand. He needs his hand, right? Okay. He needs his hand. He need his hand. Okay. He needs hand. He needs hand. So, one more line right here, on this side, one on this side, okay? That's good, I like that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so one more line, right there, one right here. Okay, so that's his arm, right? He needs his hand, right? So, yeah. so his hand, we just need to draw a circle like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, his belt too. Right, right, right Shannon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's the basic thing. So Shannon says he needs his bell, right? Right. Oh my gosh. He needs his bell right here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hey, you know, hey, you know, 
So he needs a bell. One more line like this, right? And right here. Okay. So now you can add uh, something inside his uh, show right here. So this, you see this one right here? You know, on the Sonia, they have uh, some thing on their shoulder, right? So you just have a one right here, one right here, and they have some but button here. Okay, so just the uh, just the button. So you have two on each side. Okay. Two more. Can have two more. Okay. And you connect them together. Just like this, okay? Very easy. I know at first it was very hard just looking at a uh, regular nutcracker, mm -hmm. but it's all depends on shapes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, and with this one inside, just like I said, you can make some draw a line in here and the um, color with the different colors so you have something different so everybody just depend on how you decorate inside okay so just some line like this okay and some line up here Rely on that side. Three in here. Okay. And with the shoe, you can add you can add the candy in there. Just like we see the picture up there, right? You can draw a circle, make like a candy, or you just have some um, line like this. Okay. Anything. Something easy. Whatever easy for you. Okay. What are we missing? So basically, the nutcracker like this, right? Yeah. Anyone finish that? Want to show your friend? I did. You did? Okay. Frankie. Yeah. Wow. wow. Frankie. Let's see, Frankie. Oh, Be careful, Frankie. Okay, let's see how Frankie Nutcracker is doing. Okay, so this is a Frankie Nutcracker here. He did good. Thank you, Frankie. Good job. Okay. Right, and who next? Oh, boy, yeah. Who next? Katie? Very okay. Let's see, careful, oh, Katie. Okay, this is Katie Nutcracker. Okay. Oh and oh she boy. even colored that too. Thank you, Katie. Okay, and who else? Me. Travis. Okay. Travis. Let's see, Travis. Let's see. Wow. Whoa, look at that, everyone. Mm. Very good job, Travis. Wow. wow, good job, good job. Very good. Everybody, give Travis a clap. Okay, good job. And who else? Jolie? Jolie. Jolie. Let's see, Jolie. Oh, no, let's see. Good job. Very good. Wow. And she can even. A little bit 
Good job, Patricia. Okay. Okay. Very good, Jolene. Good job, Patricia. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Okay. Okay. Patricia. Patricia. Oh, cool, Patricia. Good too. Hey, you have Angel today, huh? Okay, let's see. Wow, look at this. Look at this hat. Nice job, Patricia. Good job. Okay, give her applause. Thank you, Patricia. Who else? Shannon. Thank you, Patricia. Can I have some water? Shannon. Mom, Mataya, you didn't do anything today? Uh -huh. Oh, no. Okay, let's see, Mashana. Let's see, Shannon. Wow, I like it. Very good. Wow. Good job, Shannon. Very good. Okay. Who am Who I missing? Maria. Good job, Shannon. And Maria looks really good today. Look at you, Maria. Oh, nice. Look at her nutcracker. Very good, Maria. Thank you. Who else? So we look we good. Oh, how about Jack? Jack, do you have anything? Jake, 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 Wow, very good, Jack. Thank you. Yeah, Everybody, yeah, good job. Vicky, yeah. do you have anything? Okay, Vicky will be the last one here. Let's see, Vicky. <laughs> okay, so that this one, right? Look good, and she even dropped two. Everyone, she has dropped two nutcracker. Wow, good job, Vicky. Okay, everybody did a very good job. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, see you next time. I don't know what the next time here. Okay, <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, okay. 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 And this is a, a decoration. They have this giant woodcracker, uh, decoracker. You can see he's got lights on him and stuff. Uh, he's really cool, but he costs three hundred dollars. Oh, I looked that up. Wow. But we got to enjoy looking at him. Oh, and he also plays Christmas music too. Oh, so it's super good. I think if I had one of those, I'd have to put a bike lock on it or something because I'd be afraid somebody would take it. Oh boy. But that's a really cool one. And you see everybody liked it there. So I love it. Yeah, it was pretty it's cute. cute. It's Scott. I love it. It's Scott and um Marilyn. And who else is there? Oh wait. Oh, no. Oh. Is it No, it's from my group. Oh yeah. Uh, and I don't think we're really music because I'm a liar. I know him. Don Ellison. Yes. Uh, Ellison. Ellison. Yeah. And these people are all, these are, well, not only are they still Allison. with Elwin, but they are back at work out there right now. So they're having uh, a kind of a good time because they're earning money, but you know, not as much fun as you guys get to have, right? Yeah, I do. So today I thought I could read some more of Charlotte's web to you. We're getting kind of close to the end. You see how much is left there? And um, we've been reading along, and uh, Charlotte is a spider, and her friend Wilbur is a pig, and she has been she has been writing words in her web to impress people about uh, about Wilbur, 
And then, you know, that's kind of basically, you know, keeping him safer for longer. And so that's nice. And because he's so famous now. Wait, wait. Yes, sir. That's your group? Yeah, that's part of my group. Yeah. Who's that one in the, in the, in the chair? That's yeah. Marilyn. We took, we took Marilyn in her wheelchair so she didn't have to like go too far in her walker. So, so anyway, um, back to the book. So now because he's all famous and everything, they've made a specially nice crate to put him in to take him on the truck to the fair. Oh, yay. Yeah. So now this is chapter 17 and it's called Uncle. But they had, in the last chapter, just left to go to the fair. So here we begin. When they pulled into the fairgrounds, they could hear music and see the Ferris wheel turning in the sky. They could smell the dust of the racetrack or the sprinkling cart had moistened it. And they could smell hamburgers frying and see balloons aloft. What kind of food do you guys like to get at the fair? Okay. Um, Quesadillas. Quesadillas, yummy. What about you? I saw you had up, Katie. Quesadillas, yummy. Quesadilla? Yeah. You right. too? Oh, I like quesadillas. <laughs> and, uh, did you have your head up, Keith? I like cinnamon candy apples. Oh, wow, that sounds good. Cinnamon candy apples. That's that red on the outside? <laughs> on a stick, yeah. Awesome. What about you, Matt? Nara? What do you like at the fair to get? Oh, no. I've met with them. What? <laughs> what do you like? Some, is there some food you like at the fair, Matt? Matt, Matt, Matt Tyers? I know. Okay. Well, Matt doesn't want to tell us. It's a secret. He doesn't want us to know he likes the giant chili cheese dog all covered with peppers and everything. What about you, Shannon? What do you like to eat at the fair? Yeah, they usually have giant oh, hot dogs. They have pizza and spaghetti too. Oh, yummy. I go for the nacho. Yeah. I, I, I can't believe nobody said that giant blue onion that they make there. It's huge, man. Yeah, they, everything there is super awesome. And, and not very cheap, though, right? Right. Okay. Yes. Oh, Patty, what do you like to eat at the fair? Ice cream. Well, they have everything at the fair, but they somehow make it bigger and better at the fair, right? Like, I heard, like, they take Twinkies and put them in some batter and fry them on a stick. I love the corn on the stick. It's so good. I love the uh, corn on the cob they put on a stick. Oh, hot fudge Sunday. That sounds good. All right. Well, now that we're all hungry, let's go back to the story. Uh, the guys in the truck could hear sheep blatting in their pants because when you go to the fair, they have lots of animals out there. <laughs> and an enormous, an enormous voice over the loudspeaker said, Attention, please. Will the owner of a Pontiac car license number H2439 please move your car away from the fireworks shed? <laughs> so, little Fern, you know, remember she was uh, Wilbur's first friend, says, Can I have some money? That's oh, what you do boy. when you go to the fair, right? And then her brother Avery said, Can I too? Oh, so, and, and Fern says, I'm going to win a doll by spinning a wheel. And it will stop on the right number. I don't know. She's going to pick a number and then see if she lands on it. And then, and then Avery says, "I'm going to steer a jet plane and make it bump into another one." Oh boy! Because he's a boy, so he's causing trouble, right? Can I have a balloon, Esfern? Can I have a frozen custard and cheeseburger and some raspberry soda pop, asks Avery. Oh boy. You children be quiet until we get the pig unloaded, said their mom. That's rude. Let the children go off by themselves, suggested Mr. Mr. Arable. The fair only comes once a year. So Mr. Arable gave Fern two quarters and two dimes, which was worth a lot more back then, right? He gave Avery five dimes and four nickels. I should make you tell me how much that is. <laughs> 
Now run along, he said, and remember the money has to last all day. Don't spend it all in the first few minutes and be back here at the truck at noon time so we can all have lunch together. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Okay. Yes, I need water, sorry. And uh, and don't eat a lot of stuff that's going to make you sick to your stomachs. Who, us? <laughs> and if you go in those swings, do you remember they have the swings that like go really fast at the fair? If you go in those, you hang on tight. You hang on very tight. Do you hear me? And don't get lost, said Mrs. Zuckerman. And don't get dirty. Excuse me. All right. It's okay. I'm going to just choke. That's all. Don't get overheated because do you remember when you go to the fair, it's always really hot, right? And watch out for pickpockets, cautioned their father. And don't cross the racetrack when the horses are coming. Uh, No. That would not be very smart, would it? Very dangerous. <laughs> the children grabbed each other by the hand and danced off in the direction of the merry-go-round toward the uh, wonderful music and the wonderful adventure and the wonderful excitement into the wonderful midway where there would be no parents to guard them and guide them and where they could be happy and free as do as they pleased. <laughs> This is arable. Oh, you guys, you're not listening. You're talking. And um, now here's the picture of them heading off to the fair. Ooh. So they get to see the big Ferris wheel. They got, they're holding hands and they're running off. Uh, let's see. what. Oh, they got, uh, they're heading for the carousel. There's balloons. There's, uh, you know, those gondola swings where you're like, you know, and that goes up. Down. Yeah, I'm scared of heights. Did you know there? Okay. Their mom watched them go. Then she sighed. Then she blew it up. <laughs> Do you really think it's all right? She asked. Well, they've got to grow up sometimes, said Mr. Airball. An affair is a good place to start, I guess. I can tell you. When I went to the fair as a kid, I got in so much trouble. Okay. There you have it. While Wilbur was being loaded and taken out of his crate and into his new pig pen, crowds gathered to watch. They stared at the sign, Zuckerman's famous pig. Wilbur stared back and tried to look extra good. He was pleased with his new home. The pen was grassy and it was shaded from the sun by a shed roof. That's good. Charlotte, watching her chance, scrambled out of the crate and climbed out to a post to the underside of the roof. Nobody noticed her. Templeton, remember Templeton the rat, was going to go along and help. He was not wishing to come out in broad daylight. He stayed quietly under the straw at the bottom of the crate. Mr. Zuckerman poured some skim milk into Wilbur's trough, put clean straw in his pen, and then he and Mrs. Zuckerman and the Arables walked away toward the cattle barn to look at purebred cows and to see the sights. It's so fun to look at all the nice animals at the fair, right? I know that the Oh, uh oh, Mr. Zuckerman particularly wanted to look at tractors. Mm. Mrs. Zuckerman wanted to see a deep freeze, a big freezer. Lurvy wandered off by himself, hoping to meet friends and have some fun on the midway. That's where they call it, where, you know, you throw balls and try to knock down the bottles and you throw darts with the balloons. That's called the midway. You like to throw the darts at the balloons, right? That's fun. Yeah, no, we got to be careful with darts. <laughs> as soon as the people were gone, Charlotte spoke to Wilbur. It's a good thing you can't see what I see, she said. Why, what do you see, said Wilbur. There's a pig in the next pen, and he is enormous. I'm afraid he's much bigger than you are. Okay, here he is. See this big pig in here? Whoa, that is enormous. That's a big pig, all right. Wow. Well, maybe he's older than I am and has more time to grow, said Wilbur. Oh, oh now Wilbur's starting to cry. Because there's a bigger pig than he is. Says, I'll drop down and have a closer look. So that's what the picture was. 
Then she crawled along a beam till she was directly over the next pin, and she let herself down on her drag line until she hung in the air just in front of the big, big snout. May I have your name? she asked politely. The pig stared at her. No name, he said in a big, hearty voice. Just call me Uncle. Oh, that's why the chapter is called Uncle. Very well, Uncle, replied Charlotte. What is the date of your birth? Are you a spring pig? Sure, I'm a spring pig, replied Uncle. What did you think I was, a spring chicken? Oh, that's a good one, eh, sister? Mildly funny, said Charlotte. I heard funnier ones, though. Glad to have met you, and now I must be going. She ascended slowly and returned to Wilbur's pet. He claims he's a spring pig. But what year? And perhaps he is. One thing is certain. He has a most unattractive personality. He is too familiar, too noisy, and he cracks weak jokes. Also, he's not anywhere near as clean as you are or as pleasant. Remember last time that he got a buttermilk bath? Woo! I took quite a dislike to him from our brief interview. Wow. He's going to be a hard pig to beat, though, Wilbur, on account of his size and weight. But with me helping you, it can be done. Well, when are you going to spin a web, asked Wilbur. This afternoon, if I, late this afternoon, if I'm not too tired, said Charlotte. The least thing tires me these days. I don't seem to have the energy I once had. Well, she's getting old too, huh? My age, I guess. Wilbur looked at his friend. She looked rather swollen and seemed listless. Ooh. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Charlotte, he said. Perhaps if you spin a web and catch a couple of flies, you'll feel better. Perhaps, she said wearily, but I feel like the end of a long day, and it's only the morning. <laughs> Clinging upside down to the ceiling, she settled down for a nap, leaving Wilbur very much worried. All morning, people wandered past Wilbur's pen. Dozens and dozens of strangers stopped to stare at him. <laughs> and admire his silky white coat, his curly tail, and his kind and radiant expression. Then they would move on to the next pair where the bigger pig lay. Lober heard several people make favorable remarks about Uncle's great size. He couldn't help overhearing these remarks, and he couldn't help worrying. And now, with Charlotte not feeling well, he thought, oh, dear. All morning, Templeton slept quietly under the straw. The day grew fiercely hot. Remember how it's always hot when you're at the fair? And at noon, the Zuckermans and the Arables returned to the pig pen. Then, a few minutes later, Fern and Avery showed up. Fern had a monkey doll in her arms and was eating Cracker Jack. And Avery had a balloon tied to his ear. He had people didn't used to wear earrings back then, so I don't know how he did that. And uh, was chewing on a candied apple. Yum. Yeah. The, the children were hot and dirty. Isn't it hot, said Mrs. Zuckerman? It's terribly hot, said Mrs. Arable, fanning herself with an advertisement of a deep breeze, the freezers. One by one, they climbed into the truck and opened lunch boxes. See, they bring their lunch with them, too. The sun beat down on everything. Nobody seemed hungry. When are the judges going to decide about Wilbur, asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Oh, not until tomorrow, said Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy appeared carrying an Indian blanket that he had won. <clears throat> That's just what we need, said Avery, a blanket. Of course it is, replied Lurvy, and he spread the blanket across the sideboards of the truck so that it was like a little tent. Oh, well, there you go. The children sat in the shade under the blanket, and it did feel better. After lunch, they stretched out and fell asleep. Oh, I'm sorry. Keith has a question. Yes, Keith? I want the dates to get better shortly. Well, I'm reading to you. Isn't that pretty cool? You'll be good. Listen to the story. Okay, now this is a new chapter. It's yeah. chapter 18. And uh, thankfully, it is called The Cool of the Evening. So I guess that it did cool off eventually. 
Let me just grab a little water here that Vanessa was sweet enough to bring me. In between chapters, we can sip water. I like okay. In the cool of the evening, when shadows darkened the fairgrounds, that's when Templeton crept out from the crate and looked around. Wilbur lay asleep in the straw. Charlotte was building a web. Templeton's keen nose detected many fine smells in the air. <laughs> yeah, probably garbage. <laughs> the rat was hungry and thirsty. Of course, he decided to go exploring. Without saying anything to anybody, he started off. Uh, excuse me, Charlotte said. Okay, bring me back a word. He's supposed to bring a word. I promise I shall be writing tonight for the last time. The rat mumbled something to himself and disappeared into the shadows. He did not like being treated like a messenger boy. After the heat of the day, the evening came as a welcome relief to all. The Ferris wheel was lighted now. Ooh, it looks so pretty at the fair at night. And it still is high. Oh, it seemed like it was twice as high as it was in the daytime with the light. There were lights on the midway. And you could hear the crackle of gambling machines and the music of the merry-go-round and the voice of the man in the Beano booth calling numbers. Uh, they have like little bean bags you throw at stuff to win stuff too. Ooh, that's yeah, that's fun. Did you ever do the one? Uh, my favorite was always trying to get the ping pong ball into the fishbowl, but I never could. Oh, the yeah, the children felt refreshed after their nap. Fern met her friend, Henry Fussy, and he invited her to ride with him in the fair as well. He even bought a ticket for her, so it didn't cost her anything. Mm -hmm. When Mrs. Arable happened to look up in the starry sky and saw her little daughter sitting with Henry Fussy and going higher and higher into the air, she saw how happy Fern looked, and she just shook her head. My, my, Henry Fussy, think of that. Oh, boy. Templeton got out of sight. In the tall grass behind the cattle barn, he found a folded newspaper. See here? He, is, he found a newspaper, and he just kind of like... Hold up in there, hiding under the newspaper. Oh, in, oh, even better. Inside it were leftovers for, from somebody's lunch. A deviled ham sandwich, a piece of Swiss cheese, part of a hard-boiled egg, and the core of a <laughs> wormy apple. Yeah. yeah, I know. The rat curled in and ate everything. It's like a banquet for a rat. Ooh. Then he tore a word out of the rolled up paper of the paper, rolled it up, and started back to Wilbur's pants. We found the word. Charlotte had her web almost finished when Templeton returned, carrying the newspaper clipping. She had left a space in the middle of the web, though. At this hour, no people were around the pig pen, so the rat and the spider and the pig were by themselves. I hope you brought a good one, Charlotte said. It is the last word I shall ever write. Here, said Templeton, unrolling the paper. Well, what does it say, asked Charlotte. You'll have to read it for me. It says, humble, replied the rat. Humble? Humble has two meanings, she said. It means not proud, and it means near the ground. Well, that's Wilbur all over. He's not proud, and he's near the ground. Well, I hope you're satisfied, sneered the rat. I am not going to spend all my time fetching and carrying. I came to this fair to enjoy myself and not to deliver papers. You have been very helpful, said Charlotte. Run along if you want to see more of the fair now. The rat grinned. There he is. He's grinning. Uh -huh. The rat is grinning. Uh -huh. oh, I'm glad. I know. Well, you know, some people have pet rats and they're very... Um, they actually are very affectionate and loving, but very I don't I don't want one either, so I'm with you. Very dangerous. Oh, well, rats, you don't want to have rats around outside because that means things aren't clean enough. But if you have a pet one, that's different. Yeah, I had two cats in my house. Oh, well, then the rat wouldn't last. <laughs> I saw one that's in my patio. Yeah. I saw one in my patio. Okay, so the old sheep was right. The rat said, this bear is a rat's paradise. What, paradise. what eating and what drinking and everywhere you 
good have good hiding places and good hunting for food. Bye bye, my humble Wilbur. Fare thee well, Charlotte. You old schemer. This will be a night to remember in a rat's life. That's probably not very often to get a ride to the fair, right? So he vanished into the shadows, and Charlotte went back to her work. It was quite dark now. In the distance, fireworks began going off. Woo! Rockets! Scattery fiery balls in the sky. By the time the Arables and the Zuckermans and Lurvy returned from the grandstand, uh, so that was where they were all sitting watching the fireworks, Charlotte had finished her web. The word humble was woven neatly in the center, but nobody noticed it in the darkness. Everyone was tired and happy. Fern and Avery climbed into the truck and they lay down. They pulled the Indian blanket over them. Lurvy gave Wilbur a forkful of fresh straw. Mr. Arable patted him. Time for us to go home, he said to the pig. See you tomorrow. Oh, I guess they are going to go home. The grown-ups climbed slowly into the truck, and Wilbur heard the engine start and then heard the truck moving away in low speed. He would have felt lonely and homesick, but Charlotte was with him, so he had a friend. He never felt lonely when she was near. In the distance, he could still hear the music of the merry-go-round. Oh. As he was dropping off to sleep, he spoke to Charlotte. Sing me that song again about the dung and the dark. Not tonight, she said in a low voice. I'm too tired. Her voice didn't seem to come from her web. Where are you? asked Wilbur. I can't see you. Are you on your web? I'm up back here, she answered, up in this back corner. Well, why aren't you in your web? asked Wilbur. You almost never leave your web. Wilbur closed his eyes. Charlotte, he said after a while. Do you really think Zuckerman will let me be and not uh, uh, do me in when the weather gets colder? Do you really think so? Of course, said Charlotte. You are a famous pig and you are a good pig. Tomorrow you will probably win a prize. <laughs> the whole world will hear about you. You have nothing to fear, Wilbur, nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever, who knows? And now, go to sleep. For a while, there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What are you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, making something, she said. Making something as usual. Is this something for me, asked Wilbur? No, said Charlotte, it's something for me. For change. Well, please tell me what it is, begged Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said, when the first light comes into the sky and the sparrows stir and the cows rattle their change, when the rooster crows and the stars fade, when early cars whisper along the highway, you look up here and I'll show you something. I will show you my masterpiece. Ooh, sounds interesting. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was sleeping peacefully deep in the straw. Miles away at the Arable's house, the men sat around the kitchen table mm, eating a dish of canned peaches and talking over the events of the day. Upstairs, Avery was ready for bed and asleep. Mrs. Arable was tucking Fern into bed. Did you have a good time at the fair, she asked as she gave her daughter a little kiss goodnight. Fern said, yes, I had the best time I have ever had anywhere or any time in my whole life. Well, said Mrs. Arable, isn't that nice? Now, there's a new chapter. Are we going to finish soon? I, can, I think it's probably not too long, but that's a cute. We'll keep reading for a few more minutes. This chapter nine is the egg sack. What eggs? What? The next morning, when the first light came into the sky and the sparrows stirred in the trees, when the cows rattled their chains and the rooster crowed and the early automobiles went whispering along the road, Wilbur awoke and looked for Charlotte. He saw her up overhead in a corner near the back of his pen. 
She was very quiet. Her eight legs were spread wide. She seemed to have shrunk during the night. Next to her, attached to the ceiling, Wilbur saw a curious object. It was sort of a sack or cocoon. It was peach colored and looked as though it were made of cotton candy. And so here's what he saw, this bowl. This ball is bigger than Charlotte. Well, what is in the ball, I wonder? Are you awake, Charlotte? He said softly. Yes, came the answer. Well, what is that nifty little thing? Did you make it? I did indeed, replied Charlotte in a weak voice. Is it a plaything? I should not I should say not. It is my egg sack, my magnum opus. It's like a big deal. <laughs> I don't know what a magnum opus is, said Wilbur. Well, that's Latin, said Charlotte. It means great work. This egg sack is my great work. The finest thing I have ever made. Well, what's inside it? asked Wilbur. Eggs? Wow. Listen to the answer. 514 of them, she replied. Oh. 514, said yeah, Wilbur. You're kidding. Fine. Well, yeah, spiders have a lot of babies. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I am not. I counted them. I got started counting, so I just kept on to keep my mind occupied. Well, it's a perfectly beautiful egg sack, said Wilbur, feeling happy as though he has constructed himself. Yes, it is pretty, replied Charlotte patting the sack with her two front legs. Anyway, I can guarantee that it is strong. It is made of the toughest material I have. It's also waterproof. The eggs inside, or the eggs are inside and will be warm and dry. I guess it does need to be waterproof, doesn't it? Charlotte, said Wilbur dreamily, are you really going to have 514 children? Well, if nothing happens to it, yes, she said. Of course, they won't show up until next spring. Wilbur noticed that Charlotte's voice sounded sad. Well, what's making you sound sad? I should think you'd be terribly happy about this. Oh, don't pay any attention to me, said Charlotte. I just don't have much pep anymore. I guess I feel sad because I won't ever see my children. What do you mean you won't see your children? Of course you will. We'll all see them. It's going to be 514 baby spiders running around all over the place. Oh boy. <laughs> and the geese will have a new set of goslings and the sheep will have their new lambs. Maybe, said Charlotte quietly. However, I have a feeling I'm not going to see the results of last night's efforts. I don't feel good at all. I think I'm languishing, to tell you the truth. Wilbur didn't understand the word languish, and he hated to bother Charlotte by asking her to explain it. But he was so worried, he felt that he had to ask, what does languishing mean? It means I'm slowing up, feeling my age. I'm not young anymore, Wilbur, but I don't want you to worry about me. This is your big day today. Look at my web. Doesn't it show up well with the dew on it? Charlotte's web had never looked more beautiful than it looked this morning. Each strand held dozens of bright drops of early morning dew. The light from the east struck it and made it all plain and clear. It was a perfect piece of design and building. In another hour or two, a steady stream of people would pass by, admiring it and reading at it, reading it and looking at Wilbur and marveling at the miracle. As Wilbur studied the web, a pair of whisper, whiskers and a sharp face appeared. Oh, that's our friend Rat Templeton. Uh, slowly, Templeton dragged himself across the pen and threw himself down in a corner. I'm back, he said. What a night. The rat was swollen to twice his size. His stomach was as big around as a jelly jar. In case he found lots all that fun food we were talking about. He's eating the part get thrown on the ground in the trash. <laughs> what a night, he repeated. What feasting and carousing, a real gorge. I must have eaten the rema half the remains of 30 lunches. Never have I seen such leavings and everything well ripened and seasoned with the passage of time. In other words, starting to get rotten. 
and the heat of the day. Oh, it was rich, my friends, rich. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Charlotte. It would serve you right if you had an acute attack of indigestion. Ah, don't worry about my stomach, said Templeton. I can handle anything. And by the way, I've got some bad news. As I came back that big next door, the one that calls himself uncle, I noticed a blue tag on the front of his pen. That means he has won first prize. I guess you're licked, Wilbur. You might as well relax. Nobody's going to hang any metal on you. Furthermore, I wouldn't be surprised if Zuckerman changes his mind about you. Where do he get a hankering to have you? He'll take uh, the end of you. Still, be still, Templeton, said Charlotte. You're too stuffed and bloated to know what you're saying. Oh, boy. Don't pay attention to him, Wilbur. Wilbur tried not to think about what the rat had just said. He decided to change the subject. Templeton, said Wilbur, if you weren't so dopey, you would have noticed Charlotte has made an egg sack. She is going to become a mother. For your information, there are 514 eggs in that peachy little sack. Is this true, the rat said? I this really? Yes, it is true, said Charlotte. Oh, congratulations, murmured Templeton. This has been a night. He closed his eyes, pulled some straw up over himself, and dropped off into a deep sleep. Wilbur and Charlotte were glad to be rid of him for a while anyway. At nine o'clock, Mr. Arable's truck rolled into the fairgrounds and came to a stop at Wilbur's pen. Everyone climbed out. Look, cried Fern. Look at Charlotte's web. Look what it says. The grown-ups and the children joined hands and stood there studying the new sign. Humble, said Mr. Zuckerman. Now, isn't that just the word for Wilbur? Everyone rejoiced to find that the miracle of the web had been repeated. Wilbur gazed up lovingly into their faces, and he looked very humble and very grateful. Fern winked at Charlotte. Ha <laughs> she knew where that came from. Lurvy soon got busy. He poured a bucket of warm slops into the trough, and while Wilbur ate his breakfast, Lurby scratched him gently with a smooth stick. <laughs> Wait a minute, cried Avery. Look at this. He pointed to the blue tag on Uncle's head. This pig has won first prize already. The Zuckermans and the Arables stared at the tag. Oh, boy. Mrs. Zuckerman started to cry. Oh, nobody said a word. They just oh, no. stared at the tag. Then they stared at Uncle, that really big pig. Then they stared at the tag again. Lurvy took out an enormous handkerchief and blew his nose. <clears throat> Very loud. In fact, so the noise was heard by the stable boys over at the horse barn. Can I have some money first? And I want to go out on the midway. You stay right where you are, said her mother. Tears came to Fern's eyes. What's everybody crying about, asked Mr. Zuckerman. Let's get busy. Edith, bring the buttermilk. No, no maybe she's going to give her a new bath. Mrs. Zuckerman wiped her eyes with her handkerchief. She went to the truck and came back with a gallon jar of buttermilk. Bath time, said Zuckerman cheerfully. He and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery climbed into Wilbur's bed. Avery slowly poured the buttermilk on Wilbur's head and back, and as it trickled down his sides and cheeks, Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman rubbed it into his skin and hair. Passers-by stopped to watch. Pretty soon, quite a crowd had gathered. Wilbur grew beautifully white and smooth. The morning sun showed through, showed through his pink ears, because they're kind of thin. He isn't as big as that pig next door, remarked one bystander, but he's cleaner. That's what I like. So do I, said another man. He's humble, too, said a woman reading the sign on the web. Everybody that visited the pig pen had a good word to say about Wilbur. Everyone admired the web, and of course, nobody noticed Charlotte. Suddenly, a voice was heard on the loudspeaker. 
Attention, please, it said. Oh. Will Mr. Homer Zuckerman bring his famous pig to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand? Everyone is invited to attend. Crate your pig, please, Mr. Zuckerman, and report to the judge's booth promptly. For a moment after this announcement, the Arables and Zuckermans were unable to speak or move. Wow. Then Avery picked up a handful of straw and threw it high in the air and gave a loud yell. Woohoo! The straw fluttered down like confetti into Fern's hair. Mr. Zuckerman hugged Mrs. Zuckerman and Arable and Mr. Arable kissed Mrs. Arable. Oh. Avery kissed Wilbur. When well, my taste good, he's got that buttermilk on him. Lurvy shook hands with everybody. Fern hugged her mother. Avery hugged Fern. Wow, that's pretty good for a brother and sister. Mrs. Arable hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Up overhead, in the shadows of the ceiling, <laughs> Charlotte crouched unseen, her front legs encircling her sack. Okay, I was like, here's a picture of everybody celebrating. They're hugging. Uh, the boy Avery there is doing a handstand. They're all celebrating because they're getting called up to the front. I don't know what they're going to do then, but it's exciting. What is now? Now, uh, well, I, because look, and now it says Charlotte, her heart was not beating as strongly as usual, and she felt weary and old. But she was sure at last that she had saved Wilbur, and she felt peaceful and contented. You see, she, she's got 514 babies that she eggs in that sack. She's probably kind of worn out. We have no time to lose, shouted Mr. Zuckerman. Larvy, help me with the crate. Can I have some money, asked Fern. You wait, said Mrs. Arable. Can't you see everybody is busy? Put that empty buttermilk jar into the truck, commanded Mr. Arable. Avery grabbed the jar and rushed it to the truck. Does my hair look all right, asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Looks fine, said Mr. Zuckerman. And he and Lurvy set the crate down in front of Wilbur. You didn't even look at my hair said Mrs. Zuckerman. You're all right, Edith, said Mrs. Arable. Just keep calm. Templeton, asleep in the straw, heard the commotion and woke up. He didn't even know exactly what was going on, but when he saw the man shoving Wilbur into the crate, he made up his mind to go along. He watched his chance, and when no one was looking, he crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw at the bottom. All ready, boys, cried Mr. Zuckerman. Let's go. He and Mrs. Arable, uh, Mr. Arable and Lurvy and Avery grabbed the crate and boosted it up over the side of the pen and up into the trunk. Fern jumped aboard and sat on top of the crate. She still had straw in her hair that Avery had thrown in the, in the air, and she looked very pretty and excited. Mr. Arable started the motor Everyone climbed in and they drove to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand. As they passed the Ferris wheel, Fern gazed up at us and wished she were in the topmost car with Henry Fussy at her side. So do you guys want me to keep going a little bit? It's, it's a, I, oh, okay. Well, we'll go for a little bit longer because now we're at chapter 20. And chapter 20 is called The Hour of Triumph. Sounds good, right? Yeah. Special announcement, said the loudspeaker in a pompous voice. The management of the fair takes great pleasure in presenting Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman and his favorite pig. The truck bearing this extraordinary animal is now approaching the infield. Kindly stand back and give the truck room to proceed. In a few minutes, the pig will be unloaded in the special judging ring in front of the grandstand where a special award will be made. Will the crowd please make way and let the truck pass? Thank you. Wilbur trembled when he heard this speech. He felt happy but dizzy. The truck crept along slowly in low speed. Crowds of people surrounded it. And Mr. Arable had to drive very careful in, not, in order not to run over somebody. And at last, he managed to reach the judge's stand. Avery jumped out and lowered the tailgate. I'm scared to death, whispered Mrs. Zuckerman. Hundreds of people are looking at us. Cheer up, replied Mrs. Arable. This is fun. 
That sounds scary to me too, right? I can't turn the pants. That's what's scary. <laughs> Unload your pig, please, said the loudspeaker. All together now, boys, Mr. Zuckerman said. As Seth Preferal step, men stepped forward from the crowd to help lift the crate. Avery was the busiest helper of all. Tuck your shirt in, Avery, cried Mrs. Zuckerman, and tighten your belt. Your pants are coming down. Can't you see I'm busy, oh. said Avery in disgust. Look, cried Fern, pointing. There's Henry. <laughs> Henry Fussy. Don't shout, Fern, said her mother, and don't point. Can I please have some money, asked Fern. Henry invited me to go to the Ferris wheel again, only I don't think he has any money left. He ran out of money. Mrs. Arable opened her handbag. Here, she said, here is 40 cents. Now don't get lost and be back at our regular meeting place by the pig pen very soon. Fern raced off, ducking and dodging through the crowd in search of Henry. The Zuckerman pig is now being taken from his crate, boomed the voice of the loudspeaker. Stand by for an announcement. Ooh. Templeton crouched under the straw at the bottom of the grate. What a lot of nonsense, he muttered. What a, hello, what a lot of fuss about nothing. Even Carmen got text messages about it. Over in the pig pen, silent and alone, Charlotte rested. Her two front legs embraced the egg sack. Really, I said that hours ago. Charlotte could hear everything that was said on the loudspeaker. The words gave her courage. This was her hour of triumph. As Wilbur came out of the crowd, the out of the crate, sorry, the crowd clapped and cheered. Mr. Zuckerman took off his cap and bowed. Lurby pulled his big handkerchief from his pocket and wiped the sweat from the back of his neck. Avery knelt in the dirt by Wilbur's side, busily patting him and showing off. Mrs. Zuckerman and Mr. And Mrs. Arable stood in the running board of, on the running board of the truck on the sides. Ladies and gentlemen, said the loudspeaker, we now present Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman's distinguished pig. The fame of this unique animal has spread to the far corners of the earth attracting many valuable tourists to our great state. Many of you will recall that never-to-be-forgotten day last summer when the writing appear mysteriously appeared on the spider's web in Mr. Zuckerman's call, calling, um, calling the attention of all and sundry to the fact that this pig was completely out of the ordinary. This miracle has never before been fully, has never been fully explained, although learned men have visited the Zuckerman pig pen to study and observe the phenomenon. In the last analysis, we simply know that we are all dealing with supernatural forces here, and we should all feel proud and grateful. In the words of the spider's web, ladies and gentlemen, this is some pig. Wilbur blushed. He stood perfectly still and tried to look his best. This magnif magnificent animal, continued the loud speaker, is truly terrific. You know how he's using all the words she put in the, in the web? Look at him, ladies and gentlemen. Note the smoothness and the whiteness of the coat. Observe the spotless skin, the healthy pink glow of ears and snout. It's the buttermilk, whispered Mrs. Arable to Mrs. Zuckerman. Note the general radiance of this animal. Then remember the day when the word radiant appeared clearly on the web. Whence came this mysterious writing? Not from the spider. We can rest assured of that. Spiders are very clever at reading their webs, but needless to say, Spiders cannot write. <laughs> He's wrong. Oh, they can, can't they, murmured Charlotte to herself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, continued the loudspeaker, I must not take any more of your valuable time. On behalf of the governors of the fair, I have the honor of awarding a special prize 
of $25 to Mr. Zuckerman, together with a handsome bronze medal suitably engraved in token of our appreciation of the part played by this pig, this radiant, this terrific, this humble pig, and attracting so many, attracting so many visitors to our great county fair. So, you know, they're making lots of money on people that come there and eat all that yummy food and look at stuff at the fair. There's a lot of, a lot of people from far away came. Yep, you have a question, Katie? We're almost done, Katie, don't worry. So um, they're very happy about that. And I, like, remember, she's given her like 40 cents to go on rides at the fair. Now, you know, nowadays, if you go to the fair, they're like $2 a piece. So that's like, you know, she gave her like, uh, I didn't even know, like, say, like $20. So $25 so was probably like getting $100. We'd like that, wouldn't we? Yeah. yeah. Well, Burr had been feeling dizzier and dizzier during this long complimentary speech. When he heard the crowd begin to cheer and clap again, he suddenly fainted away. Oh. <laughs> his legs collapsed, his mind went blank, and he fell to the ground, unconscious. <laughs> What's wrong? asked the loudspeaker. What's going on, Zuckerman? What's the trouble with your pig? Avery was kneeling by Wilbur's head, stroking him. Mr. Zuckerman was dancing about, fanning him with his cap. Oh, <laughs> no! <boy. laughs> He's all right, cried Mr. Zuckerman. He gets these spells. He's modest, and he can't stand all of that praise. Well, we can't give it to a dead pig, said the loudspeaker. It's never been done. He isn't dead, hollered Zuckerman. He's fainted. He gets embarrassed easily. Run for some water, Lurvy. Lurvy sprang from the judge's ring and disappeared. Templeton poked his head from the straw. He noticed, uh-oh, that the end of Wilbur's tail was within reach. Temple, Templeton grinned. Oh, I'll tend to this, he chuckled. He took Wilbur's tail in his mouth and bit it just as hard as he could bite. Ow! The pain revived Wilbur. In a flash, he was back on his feet. Yes! Ow! He screamed. Hey! Got the crowd. He's up. The pig is up. Good work, Zuckerman. That's some pig you got there. Oh, look. Jerry's laying down because he's fainted. And then uh, here's here's Templeton about to bite his tail. Uh -huh. Everyone was delighted. Mr. Zuckerman was the most pleased of all. He sighed with relief. Nobody had seen Templeton. The rat has done his work well. <laughs> and now one of the judges climbed into the ring with the prizes. He handed Mr. Zuckerman two $10 bills and a $5 bill. Because they don't have $25 bills, do they? No. <laughs> then he tied the medal around Wilbur's neck. <laughs> then he shook hands with Mr. Zuckerman while Wilbur blushed. So here he is. He's got the metal around his neck. They're handing him the money. People are hugging. And everybody is happy here. This guy taking a picture of all this, too. Uh, a great feeling of... Oh, sorry. I missed this part. And uh, the crowd cheered, and a photographer took Wilbur's picture with the metal. A great feeling of happiness swept over the Zuckermans and the Arables. This was the greatest moment in Mr. Zuckerman's life. It is deeply satisfying to win a prize in front of a lot of people. You guys like that too, right? Yep. As Wilbur was being shoved back into the crate, Lurvy came charging through the crowd carrying a pail of water. His eyes had a wild look. Without hesitating a second, he dashed the water at Wilbur. In his excitement, he missed his aim and the water splashed all over Mr. Zuckerman and Avery. Ah! They got soaking wet. Uh, you have to wait for me to take off a sip of water. I'm too excited by all this. Sorry, guys. And so that's pretty big excitement for everybody, right? Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> because when Larry got there, he didn't even notice that Wilbur wasn't fainted on the ground anymore. He just threw the water anyway. Oh, for goodness sake, fellow Mr. Zuckerman, who was really drenched. What ails you, Lurvy? Can't you see the pig is all right? You asked for water. Well, I didn't ask for a shower bath, said Mr. Zuckerman. The crowd all laughed. 
And finally, Mr. Zuckerman had to laugh too. And of course, Avery was tickled to find himself so wet. And he immediately started to act like a clown. He pretended he was taking a shower bath. He made faces and washed under his armpits. Then he dried himself in an imaginary towel. Avery, stop it, cried his mother. Stop showing off. <coughs> but the crowd loved it. Avery heard nothing but the applause. He liked being a clown in a ring with everybody watching in front of the grandstand. When he discovered there was still a little water left in the bottom of the pail, he raised the pail high in the air and dumped the water on himself and made faces. <laughs> the children in this grandstand screamed with appreciation. He's a ham, huh? At last, things calmed down. Wilbur was loaded into the truck. Avery was led from the ring by his mother and placed on the seat of the truck to dry off. The truck, driven by Mr. Arable, uh, crawled slowly. Yeah, it crawled slowly back to the pig pen. Avery's wet trousers made a big wet spot on the seat. So I've got like a few more pages left, so let me finish the book, shall I? You guys okay for a few more pages? It's not quite lunchtime yet, so I'll get done by lunchtime. So chapter 21 is the last day. Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung from his neck, but by looking out of the corner of his eye, he could see it. Yes. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like to sit still, she said. I've always been rather quiet. Yes, but you seem especially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I feel peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come soon, right? Then the snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world, for you mean a great deal to Zuckerman. And he will not harm you ever. Winter will pass, the days will lengthen, and the ice will met in the, melt in the pasture pond. Pond. The song sparrow <clears throat> will return and sing. The frogs will awake, and the warm wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy, Wilbur. This lovely world, these precious days. Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, Charlotte, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Mm -hmm. Why did you do all of this for me? He asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little while, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all this trapping and eating flies. The spiders don't really live too, too long. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life a little bit. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little bit of that. Well, said Wilbur, I'm no good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you saved me. You have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. I really would. I'm sure you would, and I thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back home in the barn cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a voice so low, Wilbur could hardly hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur jumped up. Not going back? Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I'll be gone. I haven't even the strength to climb down into the crate. I doubt it if I have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. 
Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in agony of pain and sorrow. He was going to lose his friend. Well, the spiders don't live anywhere near as long as pigs do. So great sobs racked his body. He heaved and grunted with desperation. Charlotte, Charlotte, my true friend. Come now. Let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur. Stop thrashing about. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here alone. If you're going to stay here, I'll stay too. Don't be ridiculous, oh. said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Zuckerman and Lurvy and John Arable and the others will be back any minute now, and they'll shove you into that crate and go away, and away you'll go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There'd be no one to feed you. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> the fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced around the pen. Suddenly, he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack with the 514 little spiders inside. If Charlotte herself was unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of the pen. He put his front feet on the top board and gazed around. In the distance, he saw the Arables and the Zuckermans approaching. Uh, he knew he would have to act quickly. Where's Templeton? <laughs> he demanded. He's in that corner under the straw asleep. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the rat, and tossed him into the air. Bling! That must have been funny. Templeton, pay attention! The rat, surprised out of a sound sleep, looked first dazed and then disgusted. What kind of monkey shine is this, he growled. Can a rat catch a wink asleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She only has a short time to live. She cannot accompany us, accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her exact with me. I can't reach it, and I can't climb. But you are the only one that can get it. There's there's not a second to be lost. You know, the, the rat is helpful. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up and get the egg sack. The rat yawned. He straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust, so it's old Templeton to the rescue again, is it? Templeton, do this. Templeton, do that. Templeton, please run out of the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend me a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur. Hurry it up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. He began imitating Wilbur's voice. He would turn it up, Templeton, is it? He said, ho and ho. And what thanks do I ever get for these services? Uh, never a kind word for old Templeton. Only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. Never a kind word for a rat. Templeton! Wilbur said in desperation, if you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up there. Templeton lay back in the straw. Lazily, he put his four piles behind his own, crossed his knees in an attitude, in an, uh, attitude of complete relaxation. I have a broken heart. <laughs> How touchy. I noticed that it's always me you come to when you're in trouble. And I have never heard of anyone's heartbreaking on my account. Oh, no, who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop, uh, stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton grinned and laid still. Hmm. Who made trip after trip to the dump? Why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring arable, that arable boy away? What the rotten goose egg. Bless my soul, I believe it was Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after this? you fainted in front of the crowd? Oh, Templeton, has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am, anyway, a rat of all work? <laughs> Wilbur was desperate. The people were coming, and the rat was failing him. Suddenly, he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get Charlotte's egg sack for me, 
And from now on, I will let you eat first when Lurvy slops me. I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough, and I won't touch a thing until you're through. Because you, know, you think about it, how much is a rat going to eat, right? So oh, the rat sat up. Well, you mean that? He said, I promise. I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. And he walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself up slowly to the ceiling. He crept along until he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had strength to move a little. Then Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping at the threads that fastened the sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. So here's a little picture of him getting the egg sack in his mouth. Yeah, and then we'll, and then uh, she's out of the way. It's uh, yeah. uh, look. And use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single one of those 514 eggs harmed. Let's let's switch to a bell, complained the rat. It's worth the corn candy. The Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this as long as I live. Neither will I, said the rat. I feel as though I've eaten a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got her out of sight just in time. Lurvy and John Arable and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment, followed by Mrs. Arable and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one way possible. He carefully took the little bundle in his mouth and held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered what Charlotte had told him, that the egg sack was waterproof and strong. It felt funny on his tongue and made him drool a bit. And of course, he couldn't say anything. And what's he going to say? But he was being, sh as, soon as, he, as soon as he was shoved into the crate, he looked up at Charlotte and gave her a wink. She was saying goodbye in the only way he, oh, she knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could. And she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, she whispered. Then she summoned up all her strength and waved one of her front legs at him. She never moved again. Next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart and the racehorses were being loaded into vans and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fairgrounds were soon forlorn, but they were soon deserted. The sheds and buildings were empty and forlorn. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. And the hundreds of people that had visited the fair, none of them knew that a great spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. Now, there is a little bit more. And uh, what I was going to suggest is that... Um, Later, maybe they replay the last. Uh, this, yeah, I'm going to tell you. Uh, uh, later, they'll replay this so the people that missed it can watch it. Just, just the last part. And so Wilbur came home to his beloved manure pile in the barn cellar. His was a strange homecoming. Around his neck, he wore a medal of honor. In his mouth, he held a sack of spider's eggs. There is no place like home, Wilbur thought as he placed Charlotte's 514 unborn children carefully in a safe corner. The barn smelled good. His friends, the sheep and the geese, were glad to see him back. The geese gave him a noisy welcome. Congrat congrat congratulations, they cried, nice work. Mr. Zuckerman took the metal from Rober's neck and hung it on a nail over his pig pen, where visitors could examine it. Well, that was nice, I thought you'd take it in the house. Wilbur himself could look at it whenever he wanted to. In the days that followed, he was very happy. He grew to a great size. He no longer worried about what would happen to him, for he knew that Mr. Zuckerman would keep him as long as he lived. 
Wormler often thought of Charlotte. A few strands of her old web still hung in the doorway. Do you get some of those in your house to stay forever? Every day, Wilbur would stand up and look at the torn, empty web, and a lump would come to his throat. No one had ever had such a friend, so affectionate, so loyal, and so skillful. The autumn days grew shorter. Lurvy brought the squashes and pumpkins in from the garden room and piled them on the barn floor where they wouldn't get nipped on frosty nights. The maples and the birches turned bright colors and the wind shook them and they dropped their leaves one by one to the ground. Under the wild apple trees in the pasture, the little red apples lay thick on the ground and the sheep nodded them and the geese nodded them and the foxes came in the night and sniffed them. One evening, just before Christmas, snow began falling. It covered the house and barns and woods. Wilbur had never seen snow before. When the morning came, he went out and plowed into the drifts with the, in the yard for the fun of it. Fern and Avery arrived, dragging a sled. They coasted down the lane and out onto the frozen ground in the pasture. Coasting them is the most fun there is, said Avery. The most fun there is, said Fern, is when the Ferris wheel stops and Henry or I in the top car. And Henry makes this car swing. And we can see everything for miles and miles. <laughs> Goodness, are you still thinking about old, that old Ferris wheel, said Avery in disgust? The fair was weeks and weeks ago. I think about it all the time, said Fern, picking snow from her ear. After Christmas, the thermometer dropped to below zero. Oh, cold settled on the world. The pasture was bleak and frozen. The cows stayed in the barn all the time now, except on sunny mornings when they went out and stood in the barnyard in the lee of the straw pile. The sheep stayed near the barn, too, for protection. When they were thirsty, they ate snow. The geese hung around the barnyard the way the boys hang around a drugstore, and Mr. Zuckerman fed them corn and turnips to keep them cheerful. Many, many, many thanks, they always said when they saw food coming. Templeton, Templeton moved indoors when winter came. His ratty home under the pig trough was too chilly, so he fixed himself a cozy nest in the barn behind the grain bins. He lined it with bits of dirty newspaper and rags, and whenever he found a trinket or a keepsake, he carried it home and stored it there. He continued to visit Wilbur three times a day, exactly at mealtime. And Wilbur kept the promise he had made. Wilbur let the rat eat first. Don't do that, people. Then, when Templeton couldn't hold another mouthful, Wilbur would eat. As a result of overeating, Templeton, Templeton grew bigger and fatter than any rat you ever saw. He was gigantic. He was a young, he was as big as a young woodchuck. And then here's a picture of the sheep talking to, see how fat Templeton is. Because <laughs> now instead of just eating what he can get, he's like eating first and taking eating as much as he wants. The old sheep spoke to him about his size one day. You would live longer, said the old sheep, if you ate less, wouldn't we all? Who wants to live forever, sneered the rat. I am naturally a heavy eater. And I get untold satisfaction from the pleasures of the feast. He patted his stomach and grinned at the sheep and crept upstairs to lay down. All winter, all winter time, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as though he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure for the sack next to the board fence. On very cold nights, he lay, he lay so that his breath would warm it while he was sleeping. For Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this small, round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he awaited the end of winter and the coming of the little spiders. Life is always a rich and steady time when you are waiting for something to happen or hatch. The winter ended at last. I heard the frogs today, said the old sheep one evening. Listen, you can hear them now. 
Wilbur stood still and cocked his ears. From the pond, in shrill chorus, came the voices of hundreds of little frogs. Springtime, said the old sheep thoughtfully. Another spring. As she walked away, Wilbur saw a new lamb following her. It was only a few hours old. Ah, The snows melted and ran away. The streams and ditches bubbled and chattered with rushing water. A sparrow with a streaky breast came and sang them a song. The light strengthened. The mornings came sooner. The days get longer. Almost every morning there was another new lamb in the sheepfold. The goose was sitting on nine eggs. The sky seemed wider and a warm wind blew. The last remaining strands of Charlotte's old web floated away and vanished. One fine morning, sunny day after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching his precious sack. He wasn't really thinking about anything much. But as he noticed, as he stood there, he noticed something move. As he stood there, he, no uh, he stepped closer and stared. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It was no bigger than a grain of sand. Now, you guys know how big that is. You go to the beach. And it was no bigger than the head of a pin. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan. It looked just like Charlotte. <laughs> Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved at him. <laughs> then Wilbur looked more closely. Two more little spiders crawled out and waved. Hello. They climbed around and round on the sack, exploring their new world. Then three more little spiders, then eight. Then 10, Charlotte's children were here at last. Wilbur's heart pounded. He began to squeal. Then he raced in circles, kicking manure into the air. Then he turned a backflip. Then he planted his front feet and came and stopped in front of Charlotte's, Charlotte's children. Hello there, he said. The first spider said hello, but its voice was so small that Wilbur couldn't hear it. I am an old friend of your mother's, said Wilbur. I am glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? The little spiders waved their forelegs at him. With Wilbur could only see by the way they acted that they were glad to see him. Is there anything I can get you? Anything you need? The young spiders just waved. For several days and nights, they crawled around here and there, up and down and around and about, waving at Wilbur, trailing tiny drag lines behind them and exploring their own. There were dozens and dozens of them. Wilbur couldn't count them, but he knew that he had a great many new friends. They grew quite rapidly. Soon each was as big as a BB shot. And they made tiny webs near the sack. Then came a quiet morning when Mr. Zuckerman opened a door on the north side. A warm draft of rising air blew softly through the barn cellar. The air smelled of the damp earth, the spruce of the spruce woods of the sweet springtime. The baby spiders felt that warm up draft. One spider climbed on top of the fence. Then it did something that came as a great surprise to Wilbur. The spider stood on its head, pointed his spinnerets in the air, and let loose a fine cloud of silk. The silk formed a balloon, and as Wilbur watched, the spider let go of the fence and rose up into the air. Goodbye, it said as it sailed through the doorway. Wait a minute, screamed Wilbur. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Here's the little spiders making their little webs like little parachutes and jumping off the fence. And the warm air is carrying them along. But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider, crawl, spider crawled to the top of the fence, stood on its head, made a balloon, and then sailed away. Then another spider, then another. The air was soon filled with tiny balloons, each balloon carrying a spider. Wilbur was frantic. Ah, Charlotte's baby were disappearing at a great rate. And back, children, he cried. Goodbye, they called. Goodbye, goodbye. 
At last, one little spider took time enough to stop and talk to Wilbur before making its balloon. We're leaving here in the warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We are aeronauts, and we are going into the world to make webs for ourselves. But where, asked Wilbur, wherever the wind takes us, high, low, near, far, east, west, north, south, we take to the breeze, we go as we please. Are all of you going, asked Wilbur, you can't all go. I'd be left alone with no friends. Your mother would not want that to happen, I'm sure. The air was so full of balloonists that the barn cellar looked almost as though a mist had been out there. Balloons by the dozen were rising, circling, and drifting away through the door, sailing off in the gentle wind. Cries of, come on, come on, come on, came weakly to Wilbur's ear. He couldn't bear to watch it anymore. In sorrow, he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seemed like the end of the world. To be deserted by Charlotte's children, Wilbur cried himself to sleep. <laughs> when he woke in the late afternoon, he looked at the egg sack. It was empty. He looked into the air. The balloonists were all gone. Then he walked drearily to the door where, where Charlotte's web used to be. He was standing there thinking of her when he heard a small voice. Salutations, it said. I'm up here. So am I, said a tiny little voice. So am I, said a third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place and we like you. So here's Wilbur, and now there's three little spider webs stopping at the started at the top because they are going to stay with him. Isn't that nice? Like Wilbur looked up at the top of the doorway. Three small webs were being constructed. On each web, working busily, was one of Charlotte's daughters. Can I take this to mean, asked Wilbur, that you have definitely decided to live here in the barn cellar and that I'm going to have three friends? You can indeed, said the spiders. What are your names, please? asked Wilbur, trembling with joy. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider, if you'll tell me why you are trembling. I'm trembling with joy, said Wilbur. Then my name is Joy, said the first spider. That what was my mother's middle initial, asked the second spider. A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Ariana, said the spider. Ariana. And how about me, asked the third spider. Will you just pick a nice, sensible name for me? Something not too long, not too fancy, and not too dumb, please. Wilbur thought hard. Nellie, he suggested. Fine, I like that very much, said the third spider. You may call me Nellie. She daintily fastened her orb line to the next spoke of the web. Her, Wilbur's heart brimmed with happiness. He felt that he should make a, sport, a short speech on this very occasion. Joy, Ariana, Nelly, he began. Welcome to the barn cellar. You have chosen a hollow doorway from which to string your webs. I think it is only fair to tell you that I was devoted to your mother. I owe my very life to her. She was brilliant, beautiful, and loyal to the end. I shall always treasure her memory. To you, her daughters, I pledge my friendship forever and ever. I pledge mine, said Joy. I do too, said Ariana. And so do I, said Nellie, who had just managed to catch a small gnat. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. As time went on and the months and years came and went, he was never without friends. Fern did not come regularly to the barn anymore. She was growing up and careful to avoid childish things like sitting on a milk stone near a big pen. But Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren year after year lived in that doorway. Each spring there were new little spiders hatching out to take the place of the old. Most of them sailed away on their balloons, but always two or three stayed and set up housekeeping in the doorway. Mr. Zuckerman took fine care of Wilbur all the rest of his life, and the pig was often visited by friends and admirers, for nobody ever forgot the years of his the year of his triumph and the miracle of the web. 
Life in the barn was very good. Night and day, winter and summer, spring and fall, dull days and bright days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur. This warm, delicious cellar with the garrulous geese, the changing seasons, the heat of the sun, the passage of swallows, the nearness of rats, the sameness of sheep, the love of spiders, the smell of manure, and the glory of everything. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte. Although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly, none of them, uh, none of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself. It's not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. And that's the end of the story. So, yeah, so everybody lived happily. The spiders lived short lives, and Wilbur lived a longer life, and everyone was happy, and it sounds like a wonderful story, doesn't it? So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Here in the back it says some pig. And uh, if you uh, want to figure it out, I guess you have to, like, figure out which videos it's on, but you can watch it, and I think maybe... Uh, Vanessa and Carmen might show the last part of this to you in case you missed something while you were running out to wash your hands. Because it, it's all good. That's why so, you know, the, the ending is all good news. So that's good. And you know, you guys just gotta like take it easy in your lives and have some nice friends, and you'll be good too. I have a lot of friends. You do awesome. You I know, know I know a lot of people here. Yes, that's right. A lot of people here, and you're very beloved to a lot of us. So we're happy to have you guys here. So I guess that's the end of the show. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Grace. Aww, you're welcome. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah, this is a fun story, huh? It sounded scary for a while there, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, you guys have a great day. And finish this up your lunches. And I hope they're all tasty delicious. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go eat, too. I think I got her. <laughs> oh, one more. <laughs>